，一起来跳支舞吧。It's quite easy to poke fun at how seemingly every other anime series takes place in a Japanese high school. The first place many minds will go is that it's simply a way for nasty lads to get their otaku rocks off. If you hold that bias, it's understandable. But if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'd like to talk to you about ping pong. Imagine for a moment that you are in high school. Your mind is locked on sex, drugs, and rock and roll, certainly, but you're also beginning to develop as a person. You're beginning to think about what is really going to matter to you going forward, and consciously or not, you're seeking some sort of passion, something that you can pursue with all your focus, a pursuit that you wouldn't mind consuming your life because you adore it so much. If there was a time when you felt that feeling, try to remember what you were passionate about. Picture that, and then just pretend it's table tennis, and then you, we're done. We're good. Ping pong is a story told through the eyes of young athletes growing up and trying to figure out what matters to them, juggling the fear that the sport they play could matter more than anything, as well as the fear that it might not matter at all. It is also told through the eyes of former pros, grown-ups with a few words of wisdom for the kids in whom they see themselves, but who aren't perfect either and make mistakes, trying to prevent their protege from following them too closely. It's about what we expect of other people and of ourselves, and realizing what we're capable of and what we're not. More than anything, though, it's about a goddamn hero. What's up? I'm your main man, Steak, and this is not a review of ping pong. If anything, it's a love letter to what I consider to be a perfect coming-of-age story. Spoilers ahead, so if you haven't watched Ping Pong the Animation, I urge you to check it out, and then if you feel like it, come back to this video afterward and take a walk with me. When we reach the end of our little journey, I promise you, you are gonna love this sport more than anyone. From the beginning of the first episode, Ping Pong is urging the viewer to make judgments about the characters, and I don't mean accurate judgments. We begin kind of in media res, and then we get the sense that our two leads, Tsukimoto Makoto, aka Smile, and Yukata Hoshino, aka Peko, have already made something of a name for themselves in the Katasehai Ping Pong circle. We learn about who they are through the eyes of their coaches and teammates. Let's throw up a chart of understanding and expectations. Not exactly scientific, but trust me that I'm going somewhere with this. Society's understanding of these players is what we're gonna call level one. As far as they can tell, Peko is the ultimate prodigy, the guy who's just so damn good that no normal player even has a chance of beating him. Meanwhile, Smile is the dork, the robot in the corner. The kid's smart, and he's got talent, but he ain't Hoshino. Either way, these two are a couple of assholes. Smile acts condescending and uninterested to his teammates and even his superiors, and Peko is lazy and frustrates his team by consistently beating them despite his refusal to attend practice. Of course, we're not dumb enough to believe what this chucklefuck is saying. This level one is for the background characters, those who form expectations that are so shallow we already expect them to be subverted. On level one, Peko is the best. However, it doesn't take long for the show to convey that this man, the legend himself, Joe Koizumi, aka Butterfly Joe, aka the Mr. Miyagi of the show, thinks of Peko as a slacker who has yet to reach his full potential and sees more in Smile as the player who could be truly great. Like uh, some sort of caterpillar that has yet to break out of his cocoon, if you will, you know, if you'll have me. Eyes. This is level two, the level that viewers and the more intelligent characters in the universe of the show rest comfortably on. Level two is relevant because it's where a simpler story would stop. It feels good to see an underappreciated character rise up and prove their worth to the world. I said that Butterfly Joe is the Mr. Miyagi of the show, and the allusion to the Karate Kid was intentional because that's the kind of story most people would expect Ping Pong to be. For another example, you could use almost any sports anime, but for the sake of specificity, let's talk about Hajime no Ippo, a great series that's based on a manga which predates the ping pong manga by about seven years. Makunochi Ippo is a smart kid who gets bullied at school. A coach sees greater potential in him, and with a bit of motivation, some words of wisdom, and a lot of training, Ippo not only surpasses his bullies in fighting ability, but goes on to be the goddamn featherweight boxing champion of Japan. By the way, Spoilers for Hajime no Ippo. Oops. When he reaches that goal, it feels good. We get to see the character win, but we also get to see the judgmental goons on level 1 be brought up to level 2 with us. If you want to feel bad at the start and good at the end, level 2 is really all you need. That said, let's talk about level 3. On level 2, Smile is the best. On level 3, Pico is the best again. We get to move up with everyone else, blindsided by the character that we didn't expect anything of from the start. We were so eager to see this pompous character surpassed by our underdog that we cast him aside in favor of the classic Rocky story. Like imagine if balls deep in the Frieza arc, Yamcha suddenly remembered that he fucking loved fighting and started training harder than anybody else. And then he showed up on Planet Frieza and just- Planet Frieza. Planet Namek and just fucking kicked everyone's ass. That would be the shit. But it didn't happen, so fuck Yamcha. The point is that every character of the show except level 3 Grand Matriarch Obaba 
And even some characters who barely have any screen time go through some kind of arc, some kind of change of heart in relation to their own expectations. This is why the show, as well as every character's arc, comes to a close with the rise of Peko, the true underdog. The reason I'm doing all of this chart nonsense is to make the point that Ping Pong is aware of the tropes of its genre. I'm hesitant to claim that Ping Pong is a deconstruction of the shonen sports slash battle manga genre. I think in order to be called that, the series would have to be communicating a fundamentally different message than what is normally conveyed through this kind of story. And it isn't. Not really, at least. Ping Pong was written in 96 and ran through 97. After the 80s and early 90s, when the classics that would define this genre had already had some time to leave some sort of cultural footprint. Training is important. Be true to yourself. There's always someone better than you. Listen to your heart, etc. What separates Ping Pong isn't making some greater point that contrasts with these themes, but scrutinizing them and expanding on them. It almost feels like cheating to claim that expectations are a theme of Ping Pong because expectation as a theme could be forced into almost any story. Going back to Hajime no Ippo, wow, no one expected this kid to be a great boxer, but he is. Really makes you think. But what society expects of you is a common theme in stories because subverting and surpassing expectations is a really great way of getting a certain emotional reaction. The narratives that hit the hardest are often not only commenting on the expectations of society, but for lack of a better word, tricking the reader into feeling those expectations as well. This can work especially well on the medium of television because division into seasons and episodes can punctuate dramatic shifts in tone. One of my favorite examples is an American animated series called Moral Oral, which ran on Adult Swim between 2005 and 2009. The bulk of the first two seasons centers around pretty shallow jokes at the expense of the people living in a middle American Protestant town called Moralton, where everyone claims to be morally upright and understanding life and the Bible, but really they're just terrible people doing terrible things. The season two finale and all of season three, however, stop serving as comedy and become drama, focused on how the people of the town have been lying to themselves and others just to maintain this illusion that they're happy with their lives. If the show had been this way from the beginning, it probably would have been a decently effective tragedy, but the fact that it's aware of the family guys of the world lets the viewer settle into thinking that ultimately all of this darkness doesn't matter because it's just a comedy series. The viewer feels guilt for letting their expectations get the better of them, and we realize that we've been just as shallow and judgmental as the people of the town. It took our expectations and fed them back to us. We're there with them. I'm awkwardly comparing Ping Pong to Moral Oral to show how the medium of television can serve this kind of subversion of expectations well, and how this is treated somewhat differently in the manga Ping Pong is based on. Let's use the opening as an example. Ping Pong the animation opens with Smile thinking about the hero. He's got the concept of a hero on his mind, distracted from a conversation amongst the dumbs. I thought, and you probably did too, that Smile wanted to be the hero. It's implied by this cut from the hero to Smile. There's nothing at all to connect the concept of a hero to Peko in the beginning. This cut, and the way the whole intro plays out, is not the same in the manga. So, cards on the table. In the first draft of this video, I wrote more or less the whole thing in an afternoon on an insane stimulant high, and you could tell. I did a little hand wave at the beginning where I say I'm not going to be talking about the manga because I want to discuss the series on its own merits. Ugh. The next day when the drugs had worn off, I read the script in disgrace, and to make up for what I had done, I decided to go and read the manga and watch the film that's based on the manga. Unfortunately, it's pretty hard to get a hold of a live-action Japanese film from 2002, so I didn't get to watch the film. But I did read the manga. I'm glad I did, because it's fucking great! For most of the manga, I was kind of shocked at how totally faithful the animation is. Many scenes are practically shot-for-shot -shot remakes, which made me think that the first time I watched it, fresh off of having totally loved the Tatami Galaxy, I may have been giving director Masaki Yuasa too much credit. It even uses a smile humming Pekko's theme throughout the story as a leitmotif despite being a manga and not having a score, which is, you know, odd. <laughs> Getting back on topic, this whole bit at the beginning is in the manga, but it's played very differently. We start with a prologue showing that Smile and Peko have grown up playing ping pong at Tamara Table Tennis, and with a shot of the hero. But the prologue isn't present in the series. Then we get to the bit with the hero, but these panels more closely mirror shots that happen much later in the series, where it's clearer that Smile is thinking of Peko as the hero. There are a number of other differences, some more significant than others, but this is what I consider to be the biggest fundamental difference between the manga and the series. The rise of the Peko... The, ri the rise of Peko in the series is more effectively communicated as a twist. Okay, hero.
The manga's opening gives Smile and Peko much greater presence, and pretty clearly implies that Peko is going to become more relevant later on. That isn't to say that I think the manga doesn't consider the theme of expectation relevant. After all, like I said, practically every beat of the story present in the series is in the manga. The series owes just about everything to the original work, but this one small change does affect how the reader slash viewer will react to the story. The story gives Peko's rise to becoming a hero a bit more of a build-up, and has him vocally expressing his misery while he sinks into his funk, rather than denying that there's a problem altogether. For that one change, and what the series has to gain from being animated and having voices and a score to go along with it, if you had to pick one, I would say the animation is more effective at getting you to feel what it wants you to feel. Being able to hear the crowd, the sound of ping pong balls bouncing, and the song Smile is Humming, to me, make the series a more complete package. Still, I would urge anyone who enjoyed the series to read the manga. Oftentimes, an adaptation will cut parts from the original work, leading purists to believe that the true way to experience the story is through the original medium. This is often true, and there are some changes that the animation does make, but because of the nature of manga and anime, both being communicated through drawings on paper, adaptations that detract little and add more to the story can flourish. That's just my take though, and I saw the animation first, so I'm obviously more attached to it. Thankfully, we live in a world where you can partake in and appreciate both. For the rest of this video, you can assume that most of whatever praise I have for the series applies to the manga too. Just go read it, it's a good time. So this is getting pretty heavily into death of the author territory because I'm going to be discussing how I feel the look of the show serves the themes of the story. When the show's visual design is pretty much a two and two combination of manga author Taya Matsumoto's character and panel designs and director Masaaki Yuasa's animation and color choices. Yuasa is known for his flat, pastel colors and expressive, unique, and occasionally off-model keys. Matsumoto, on the other hand, has designs that can be considered both more realistic and less detailed than other industry-standard type designs. All these are pretty good. What? What is this segment? Shoujo. What's the same? The result is an art style, which I'll just come out and say I adore. The flat colors and lack of detail allow the artist to focus on creating incredibly expressive keys, and when I say expressive, I mean that in a couple of ways. The more realistic features of the characters allow them to portray subtle emotions that would be more difficult with big anime googly eyes. The abstract nature of the visuals also means characters rarely stay on model, so they're allowed to be posed and scaled however they need to in order to convey the emotions of the scene. Like I said, expressive. But whatever, I think it looks good, you think it looks bad, this is all largely irrelevant. What matters is, do the artistic choices made in regards to the visuals serve a purpose? abso fucking lootly for one thing, as I've been into the ground, a major theme of the show is how we judge things on a service level. I can't help but think that the show's somewhat crude art style is encouraging you, the viewer, to look beyond what you might find classically appealing. Sure, sometimes it looks like the wild thornberries, but there are just as many moments when the show is strikingly beautiful. Beyond that, Ping Pong is a show that's lost in the heads of the characters. I hesitate to use the word dreamlike because I think it's pretty vague and not totally applicable, but it almost applies. Dreamlike conveys a fogginess that the show is not necessarily coherent or logical, but that you understand the emotions it's communicating regardless. While this is true of director Masaaki Yuasa's other work, Ping Pong is very grounded. Nothing happens in the show that doesn't make sense. It's a very simple and linear story, but we're often treated to a look inside the minds of the characters. The way they're talking to themselves, especially while playing ping pong, the abstract symbols representing their emotions, and the memories they recall as the story goes on are all as important, if not more so, than the literal events of the story. Ping pong isn't dreamlike, it's daydream-like. That, in essence, is why I feel the visuals work. They look almost how one would imagine a child views the world. It's balancing the challenging real world of adults playing a sport professionally with the carefree, non-serious, barely lucid nostalgia of children playing games. This sort of mishmash of perspectives is the real meat and potatoes of ping pong. Like any series in this genre, the ultimate goal of almost every character is to be the best at their pursuit of choice. However, on the path to becoming the best martial artist, basketball player, spirit detective, or ping pong player, we learn a little something about ego, skill, and talent. A large portion of ping pong's depth comes from a multifaceted approach to its exploration of self-improvement. Self-improvement is an incredibly common theme in fiction, especially in shonen manga and sports-centric stories, because the desire to become a better, stronger person sells to everyone, and especially well to young men and athletes. Often a story will try to communicate some sort of message in regard to how to more effectively better oneself, such as to never seek shortcuts, to always aspire to reach greater heights, and to never let your ego convince you that it's okay to stop improving. Ping Pong doesn't come at this topic from one angle, but from every single angle, using its huge cast of complex characters as a conduit. 
It then takes the fruit of all these lessons and serves them to Pekko, creating the hero. The story wraps up all of the lessons of self-betterment in a nice package and then ties them to one theme. Flight. I don't think I'm blowing any minds by saying that it's common for a teenage boy to develop a massive ego. Possibly the best example of this being explored in a shonen manga is Yusuke Urameshi from Yu Yu Hakusho. Yusuke's arc has him start off as a punk kid who doesn't care about anyone, but over the course of the series has him growing up and realizing that there are more important things in life than seeming like a badass. Ironically, learning that lesson makes him into kind of a badass, wow. Just what a beautiful world. He learns he doesn't need to be afraid of his own feelings or caring about other people. This is certainly a huge part of ping pong, as practically every character is introduced as being pig-headed and having a huge ego about themselves. Kong Wing is perhaps the proudest character in the show, taking pride both in his playing abilities and in being from China. The most important piece of Kong's puzzle is his desire to go home. Success in ping pong in Japan would be his ticket back home to China. That's why they keep showing this fucking airplane and how flight relates to Kong. Kung is already a terrific player, but on account of a few nasty losses, he is disgraced and unwilling to return to China. Kong doesn't need to learn to fly, he just needs to not be afraid of flying. His roadblock to happiness isn't his skill, it's his pride. The airplane is also used as a metaphor in this guy's arc, but I'm gonna save him for later. Basically, just think of the airplane as flight for characters who aren't happy on account of their own mental hangups rather than their lack of skill. Pride is getting in the way for Pekko too, but in a very different way. Pekko can't improve because he's too proud of himself. He scams less capable players out of their money, earning the pseudo-respect of his teammates and more snacks he can bitch about. He constantly expects to be treated like a king, but characters who are more aware tend to ignore him. He never has trouble winning games, but this is because he's never played anyone willing or capable of showing him what real competition is. When an outside force, being Kong Wang, completely humbles him, he wastes no time throwing a tantrum, telling Smile that he's quitting. He's then surprised when Smile doesn't really care. The big fish in a small pond metaphor is especially pertinent because the show regularly uses the sea as a metaphor for giving up, functionally the opposite of flight. Submission, adequacy, doing the bare minimum, etc. They keep showing a seagull in relation to Pekko, an animal that can fly, but can more easily float along on top of the ocean. Pride is also a major issue for Kazuma, and to a lesser extent Smile, but their problems run a bit deeper than that. As Butterfly Joe puts it, Smile lacks any sort of competitiveness. We find out by the end of the series that Smile is only able to be happy when he's playing with the full extent of his abilities against Pekko. And before that, Smile never loses a game that he doesn't throw on purpose. Joe sees himself in Smile, and the connection to the theme of flight is through a butterfly. Without considering his connection to Pekko, Joe assumes that Smile is like him, a butterfly that needs to grow its own wings. Joe's expectation that Smile will become like him is ultimately unfounded, though. Smile doesn't become happy through Joe's training, and Obaba was correct in assuming that their relationship would be a disaster. It's only after she explains to Joe that he needs to show Smile a bit of love if he wants him to grow that their training starts to bear any sort of fruit. Even then, it's not through Joe that Smile learns to fly. In the butterfly metaphor, the locker that Smile's bullies used to lock him in was his cocoon. He was comfortable and safe in there. The way he gets out of his cocoon without being afraid is by taking on the persona of the robot through Butterfly Joe's training. Ironically, Butterfly Joe completely fails in teaching a caterpillar how to fly. Kazuma is on the other side of the same coin. He's unhappy, but due to his past trauma, he takes the game far too seriously. He carries the weight of his family name and his teammates on his back, and he's attempting to mask the pain of losing his father. In doing so, he effectively ruins his relationship with his kind of girlfriend cousin Yurie. It is established, however, that Kazuma had to disregard his personal life in order to maintain his position at the top, through the arc of his second-in-command, Sanada. Sanada wanted to be with Yurie and wanted to surpass Kazuma, but during the final tournament, he comes to terms with the fact that it's impossible to do both. He then tells Kazuma that he admires him for being willing to throw away everything for the reputation of the school. So we have Kong and Pekko being consumed by their pride, Smile being unwilling to take this sport seriously, and Kazuma taking it way too seriously. With all that in place, there's one final piece of the puzzle, one last brutal pill to swallow, and a theme that, unlike so many other stories of self-improvement, Ping Pong is willing to deal with. The character that drags Pekko out of the shadows and into the light, and that best embodies this theme, is this man right here, Manabu Sakuma. Sakuma more or less takes on the role of Pekko's rival, the character who wants more than anything to beat this smug asshole and prove his superiority. His table tennis philosophy is the polar opposite of Pekko's. Whereas Pekko thinks that only people who aren't naturally talented need to try hard, Sakuma believes that talent doesn't exist and that by training with everything you have, you can beat anyone. But when he banks everything on his training in a game against Smile, 
he loses. Sakuma really thought that he could win against Smile after beating Peko because by beating the smug prodigy, he's proven that effort beats talent. However, Smile has both. Peko's expectation of victory and subsequent loss drives him to quit, and so does Sakuma's. But after quitting the game, their feelings are totally different. Peko is totally miserable, but Sakuma is at peace. In one of my favorite scenes of the show, right after my other favorite scene, the ultimate kick in the dick Christmas scene where every character besides Ota, Sakuma, and kind of Kong Wang are shown at their lowest, Peko and Sakuma have a little chat. Sakuma explains that there are some things that are only clear when competition isn't a factor. Here's where the bird metaphor comes in again. Sakuma tells Peko that not all birds can fly, alluding to, for example, the noble penguin. Sakuma had a physical disability that meant that no matter how hard he tried, he'd never reach the same heights as the truly great players. Like a penguin, he can try as hard as he wants to fly, but in the end, his place is in the sea. AKA being a fucking quit. Echo, on the other hand, was deluding himself into thinking that ping pong didn't matter to him, and was protecting his own pride. In the heat of adolescence, Peko throws himself into the sea, exclaiming that he's flying before being cut off by landing in the water. He becomes comfortable, but then realizes that he's drowning. When he's about to lose everything, when competition isn't a factor, he enters a dreamlike state where he begins to remember what really matters to him. Sakuma then drags him back to shore and in turn to reality. Peko's place is not in the ocean, it's in the sky. It's important to note here that the show correlates but does not directly connect the concept of enjoying something and having the natural skill to be great at it. Sakuma obviously enjoyed table tennis, but in order to be an incredible player, he also had to be talented at it. Also, I love Tekken, but I'm the worst Steve Fox in the world. Peko is talented, and in his heart, he loves the game, but he needs to get over his ego and combine his philosophy with Sakuma's to find a perfect middle ground. Everything comes together when Peko realizes that Smile used to, well, a uh, smile when he played table tennis. From here, everything has come together. Peko is over his pride, he understands that the game is important, he knows it's important to enjoy playing, he knows he has a great talent for the game, but he also understands that to become a better player, he's going to have to work hard. Our boy's on the road to becoming Ellipsis, the hero. Peko is the hero, not only in that he's the strongest player, but also that he saves just about everyone from their miserable state of affairs. Ping Pong looks at a whole slew of reasons why people would be playing Ping Pong, and really, none of them are that the players actually enjoy playing the game. The final two episodes of the series take place during a tournament where the players who haven't given up on the sport face each other in a tournament that Peko sweeps in its entirety. Along the way, Peko's sheer love for the sport wins over all of his opponents, and they begin to understand why they ever enjoyed playing the game in the first place. During the final tournament, Kong Wing plays Peko and Sonata plays Smile, and Peko and Smile both win. I mentioned before that this is where Sonata's arc basically concludes, and it's also where Kong's does. He gets a feel what playing against a hero, a guy who's overflowing with love for ping pong, feels like. It's worth mentioning that Kong's arc was 90% finished before this. Having lost in the first tournament, he's depressed, but he finds peace in accepting that he won't be flying back to China. He enjoys Christmas with his teammates and enters the final tournament with a different attitude. Sanada, on the other hand, learns a bit more about Kazuma's perspective. He tells Kazuma that he's got balls putting the sport and team before himself. Earlier, Kazuma had mentioned to Sakuma that he plays ping pong for himself, but then he tells Sanada that he plays for the team. You could read this a number of ways, one being that Kazuma is lying to Sanada. However, my interpretation is that Kazuma doesn't really know why he plays table tennis. He just has so many responsibilities and so much weight to carry that he doesn't get to consider the reason why he would play in the first place. Kazuma spends every episode becoming sadder and scarier. Kazuma lost his father to an accident where he fell to his death. Kazuma was a child and has spent years thinking about how, if he could only fly, he wouldn't have died. In his teenage years, he turned that pain into motivation. He understands that people can't fly. There's no way to the top but to climb, no matter how much it hurts. He doesn't believe that anyone can fly, and he doesn't believe that enjoying the sport of ping pong matters. Before Yurie leaves for Europe, she says that no one's waited for a hero longer than he has. In his match against Peko, Peko has a busted knee, and Kazuma fully expects this to be his downfall. After all, people have limits, no matter how strong they are. He's shouting at Peko, both taunting him and sort of begging him to win. I have a hard time deciding what tone of voice I can use to narrate the script in this part because I love this part more than anything in the world. So just, okay, so 
Peko becomes the hero. He's having so much fun that Kazuma can't keep up. Against all logic, Peko begins to win. This is my favorite line ever. Everything Kazuma has hoped for has come true. He's smiling. He's learned that limits can be broken. Shh, I'm not crying! You're crying! Finally understands that there's no point in giving up everything to play a game if you're not going to love every minute. Something he'd previously thought impossible. This is the logical conclusion of the show. The dragon was defeated and learned to fly. There is one more episode after this though. See, earlier in the show, Joe gave Smile this whole speech about how his friend who went on to become the chairman of Kaio Academy had a busted knee, and feeling sorry for him, Joe let him win a very important game. This situation mirrors his and Pekko's as they're about to face off in the final match. Smile had that problem of worrying about his opponent's feelings and letting them win. But Joe warns him that that sort of thing didn't do his friend any favors in the long run. It's kind of a red herring though because the payoff for this little subplot is that Smile doesn't need to let Pekko win because Pekko and Smile aren't Joe and the Chairman. Mr. Tsukimoto ni question. Jakuten o semerareta hero wa dou naru ne? Hero ni jakuten nado arimasen. Pekko overcomes his injury before he even has to play against Smile. And playing against Pekko with everything he had and losing was all Smile ever really wanted. Pekko beating Kong, then Kazuma, then Smile is such a shock to everyone's system that they're shaken out of their cloud of expectation. Kong finally finds real peace in losing to someone who loves the game. The old pros make up and get in touch with their past, ironically mirroring Smile and Pekko in how they relate to each other as friends, rather than how they play against each other as competitors. Sakuma, back in action with a sick-ass pompadour, cries because he finally gets to see Pekko play with his heart again. This match between Pekko and Smile is two best friends, full of talent and spirit, going at it and remembering why they love the sport and each other. Smile finally gets to feel like a human being again. He's not a robot, he's not made of metal, it's just that blood tastes like iron. We actually don't get to see the end of the match here, and we don't find out who won until later, and really it doesn't matter. You spend the whole show expecting the outcome of the final match to be a big deal, and then they just shrug it off. Just another part of history. As an adult, Smile ended up becoming a teacher like Butterfly Joe. Pekko taught Smile to grow wings and fly, and he didn't need to be forced into the life of a professional despite the fact that he would have been great at it. Kong overcame his shame, returning to China and becoming a pro player, going to the Olympics while Kazuma got kicked off the national team. This is a fine ending for Kazuma because he finally got to stop carrying his weight. Sakuma starts his own life independent of the world of ping pong. Smile says, I don't think staking your life on table tennis is such a bad thing, and throws his paddle into the sea. Everyone finally found a decent middle ground where they can enjoy the game at their own pace, caring about ping pong exactly as much as they need to to be happy, the best of them being Pekka. The events of the final confrontation lead all the characters to overcome the pitfalls of being teenage athletes. The series doesn't claim that there's any right way to grow up, and everyone goes off in their own direction, living unique lives and learning their lessons at the hands of a hero. That is a perfect coming-of-age story. Hi, my name is Afro. What's up, y'all? There's more to talk about with Ping Pong. I barely even mentioned a number of super important character development scenes, and I didn't even discuss the whole Kaio using Kazuma and Yurie to sell products to idiots angle and everything that entails. Yurie is an important character, and so is the chairman of Kaio, and I didn't even bring him up until the end, but I'm tired, and honestly, I feel I've made my point. I wanted to talk about Afro Guy at the very end because it's a way of ending the series with a big fat in summation. See, Afro Guy is a microcosm of the whole series. He loses a match, gives up on ping pong, goes to the sea, buys a plane ticket around the world, and is utterly unsatisfied. He runs away from his loss, expecting trying a bunch of different things to make him happy, and he never becomes happy. Finally, he watches Pekko play on a whim and realizes he loves ping pong. He keeps expecting happiness from running away from his problems, and then returns, and, against all expectations, remembers what made him happy in the first place. That's why the outcome of the final match doesn't really matter, because everyone was already having fun before it ended. That's the message of the entire series. No matter what you expect, you can't control every outcome. You can't turn someone younger than you into you. You can't force your future. You can't assume that your motivation is greater than anyone else's, and there's always going to be things you can't achieve. You can't pursue a passion seeking an outcome, or to affect other people, or for money, or for glory. You've just got to do it for yourself. If you love something, you run till you puke blood and practice swinging till you shit blood. And whether you win or not, it won't really matter. 
But I'm just saying you probably do win because you belong at the top, and that's what's up. This has been your main man steak. Thanks for watching this sweet anime vid. ヘコ。スマイルのためにうつのかい。ちげえよ、ババ。俺らがヒーローだからしょ。そこんとこよろしく。愛してるぜ。ヘコ。心の中で3回唱えろ。ヒーロー剣山。ヒーロー剣山。